Curing epilepsy is a true medical challenge. We all know how it manifests itself from the outside. But on the inside, epilepsy is actually a set of chronic neurological disorders, uh, which can have very different causes. One of the leading experts in the world in this field is our first speaker of the day, Thomas Grunwald. He runs the Swiss Epilepsy Center in Zurich. Professor Grunwald, the stage is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to first to thank the organizers and especially Dr. Valid Jufali for inviting me and for letting me talk about clinical problems. It's not easy to talk about clinical problems when there are so many people following us on the internet who would like to hear about solutions instead of problems. But still, uh, I'm very confident that um, the next speaker, Dr. Jamil Elimad, might answer some of the questions that I'm going to ask now. But let me start by assuring you that there's nothing mysterious about epilepsy. It's a very common neurological disease, in fact, one of the most common um, neurological diseases that there is. In fact, runner-up only to the headaches and maybe equal in prevalence to the cerebrovascular diseases. And in fact, it's nothing mysterious about epilepsy because it's normally easy to treat. About half of the patients become seizure-free just by one low-dose medical drug. And all in all, about two-thirds of all patients become seizure-free by medical therapy. That means, however, on the other side, that there's about one-third of all patients who do not become seizure-free by medical drugs. Epilepsy surgery can cure up to 30 or 80 percent of the patients who have um, pharmacoresistant epilepsies if it's possible to identify the place, the site in the brain where the seizures start, and if it's possible to show that this area inside the brain can be removed without problems, causing additional problems for the patients. However, there are patients in whom it's not that easy, and in these cases, it's sometimes necessary to use intracranial electrodes for invasive studies, for invasive pre-surgical evaluations. For example, with strip electrodes that are introduced through burr holes inside the skull on the surface of the temporal lobes or the frontal lobe, but also depth electrodes that enter the hippocampus and reach the amygdala right here, and with these electrodes, it's possible to record seizures that cannot be recorded on the surface of the scalp. Of course, you can use these intracranial electrodes also for scientific studies. For example, since we have learned from epilepsy patients who, uh, have, been, who have, have undergone temporal lobe resections and in whom hippocampus, the hippocampus on both sides has been removed, that the hippocampus is a structure that is necessary for memory. And with uh, depth electrode studies, for example, we have contributed to the finding that one of the things that the hippocampus is there for is um, registering and processing novelty, and by combining novelty with emotion, which is processed inside the amygdala, this is probably a way of the body to create relevance. And if something is really relevant, <clears throat> the chances are that you're going to remember this. The majority of patients with, who are uh, candidates for epilepsy surgery um, can be evaluated by non-invasive studies, <clears throat> especially if it's possible to find where the reason inside their brain might be for their, for their epilepsies. But there are patients in whom this is more difficult. And even in these sometimes very difficult patients, it's possible nowadays to reach seizure freedom, for example, by epilepsy surgery, if you use the right techniques. For example, this is a young boy, 11 years old, and he suffered from so-called gelastic seizures. That means he used to laugh during his seizures. That was not very impressive for outstanders. Some people wouldn't even notice that he was suffering from a seizure. But um, this guy didn't like it at all because it was laughing without mirth. It wasn't funny for him, especially since sometimes they were combined with micturition, with enuresis, which is very embarrassing if it happens to you um, outside. And sometimes they evolved into so-called secondarily generalized seizures. That it means seizures who spread across the whole brain and they are associated with tonic-clonic movements, which are quite dangerous sometimes even. In the EEG, we found focal slowing over the right frontal lobe, which is not very specific and does not prove that his, um, he really suffered from epilepsy or that his seizures started from this area. And the MRI, that means his um, magnetic resonance imaging, 
of high, uh, high resolution scanners in three different machines actually did not find anything during the years of 2005 through to 2008. So that makes it very difficult. This is one of his seizures recorded with surface electrodes. I press the button to indicate that the seizure started. <laughs> Now, that was it. You might think that this is not so bad, so if this happens only once a month, that might be all. But still, this is a dangerous condition, not the seizure itself, but what can happen to the patient while he's unconscious. During this seizure, although it's only um, affected a small part of the brain, he was unconscious. And if this happens for you, to you, for example, while you're in the bath tube, you might be, able, you might be in, at risk to drown. Um, adult patients with such seizures are not allowed to drive because if this happens while you're driving, you could um, cause a very severe accident. Right, so nothing helped. No medical drugs that we tried produced seizure freedom. And we um, did a lot of imaging study and nothing worked until we used our so-called post-processing techniques. In this case, we, um, we calculated an average of three of his uh, MRI studies and compared this to a data bank with 200 normal brains. And what you see here is a highlight of this area where the gray matter reaches a little bit too far into, inside the white matter. And this junction image highlights an area where the, the border between gray and white matter is a little bit blurred. So this is a very um, suggestive finding. It suggests that there might be a so-called focal cortical dysplasia, which is a small developmental disease, a slight disorder um, of the organization of the cortex in this area. And this produces um, possible shortcuts of the electrical activity, which is the reason for epileptic seizures. But this is still a theory. At that point, we still have to prove that, and we can prove that, in this case, for example, by implanting strip electrodes on the surface of the right frontal lobe and, uh, and the uh, medial frontal interhemispheric areas to record these seizures. Right, we could record seizures in these areas where you see the red dots, here is uh, the center for the um, direction of leg movements, so this is an area that should not be touched during the operation. And I show you here another seizure that I uh, initiated by electrostimulation. <clears throat> and I ask him to indicate when the seizure is coming, when he feels that the smile is returning. Stimulation and the seizure starts. You see, he's smiling there. So I hit the knob to switch on the laughter. I, I asked him to remember the word mouse because I was going to ask him for this word afterwards to check whether he was conscious during the seizure. Now the seizure is over. I ask him to lift the right arm. This doesn't respond yet. Now he responds. Okay. What is your name? Mike. Well, that's okay. His name is Mike. Elf. How old are you? Eleven. Where are you? Epilepsy Center. Zurich. In Zurich. Right, now he's oriented again. And the seizure is over. So, <clears throat> still you might think this is not that bad, this kind of seizure, because there's not much going on, not much hypermotor or movements during, he's not falling down. But as I said, he was unconscious during the seizures, and he had about 20 to 30 of these seizures per day. And he was switched off like this for 20 times during a day, which is a very, very bad thing for a young boy, especially if he's going to school at such a critical age. There's so much he has to learn. And if you're switched off several times during education, then you won't remember anything. So what we did was remove this area after we found that by implanting electrodes, the, ele the seizures start right here, which was in the right place. We could remove this area and by 
and so-called extended lesionectomy. Um, he, was, he has been seizure-free since four years now, and this is what he's doing for fun at the moment. So no epilepsy patients who are, are prone to suffer from um, epileptic falls could ride a horse, but he's been seizure-free for four years now, and he will also be able to drive a car once he's old enough. What you see here, the histology, that's what the colleagues found when they looked at the area that has been removed during surgery under the microscope. They found that it was a so-called type 2B focal cortical dysplasia. That's just one special form of dysplasia of developmental disorders of the cortex in this area. And about up to 80% of the patients who are operated on and who, have, who are found to have this kind of uh, lesion will be seizure-free postoperatively. And this is a a new field for epilepsy surgery because imaging studies combined with surface and intracranial uh, EG recordings make it possible to operate many of these patients who have been considered to be to suffer from non-lesional epilepsies still about five years ago and um, most of these people, people could not have been treated surgically um, still a few years ago. We now can do this. This is another patient with a temporal lobe seizure whose seizure starts and then spreads. Let's wait a moment until he notices that the seizure starts. Now he re realizes it. He presses the button to indicate the onset of the seizure. Now these are manual and oral automatisms that are the hallmarks of medial temporal lobe seizures. We even know that because has a dystonic posturing of the left hand and manual automatisms with the right, that probably these seizures started in the right temporal lobe. Does not respond. Means he's unconscious. Now you'll notice that something changes in the signs of his seizures and the symptoms that you are noticing. The myoclonic jerk, jerks in the left part of his brain, uh, of, sorry, of his face. He's turning the, left to the, the head to the left. And some more myoclonic jerks. Now the left arm is involved, that means that the seizure activity is spread from the right temporal lobe to the right frontal lobe. And now he enters the so-called tonic phase of a secondarily generalized tonic-clonic seizure. And I won't show you the rest because that uh, doesn't help us in the pre-surgical evaluation. Um, this is still a sign which is quite important for us because it's the so-called figure four. Let me show it to you. This is, something, this is something that the patient does while the seizure is spreading across the whole brain. It's very likely, or almost certain, that the seizure spreads across the frontal lobe contralateral to the extended arm. So everything fits in this patient. We, just by watching his seizure semiology, the symptoms of the seizure, and using the surface electrodes, combined with MRI, of course, but that proved that his right hippocampal hippocampus was sclerotic. We could prove that his seizure started in the right hippocampus and then spread over the right temporal lobe, over the right frontal lobe, and then affected the whole brain. So in this case, it was easy to operate on him, and he has been seizure-free since six years now. But there are others in whom, for example, these invasive studies find out that both hippocampi are sclerotic or functionally uh, disturbed, which would mean that if the, uh, this operation would be performed, he might lose his memory. And in these cases, we cannot suggest epilepsy surgery. So let's just imagine for a moment that this patient would suffer from both medically and surgically intractable epilepsy. It, this seizure shows you that there is a time during, when the seizure starts during which the patient is still conscious. 
Then it starts a little bit more and it becomes unconscious and then it affects the whole brain and then you have the tonic-clonic movements during which patients might fall, hurt themselves, drown, burn themselves, for example, when they're smoking, so which is really dangerous. And it's even more dangerous when such a kind of seizure does not stop. This is what we call a convulsive status epilepticus and without treatment, um, about 50% of the convulsive state epilepticy end with death. They're lethal. And as I said, it's a common disease. And these problems affect only a small part of epilepsy patients, but in the general population, these are big numbers. The prevalence of epilepsy in Saudi Arabia is about 270,000 patients. In Switzerland, we have 80,000, because Switzerland is a small country. But it means that um, if you calculate the deaths that are associated by epilepsy or by seizures and compare them to the normal deaths that can be expected every year, you'll find that around about 2,000 deaths every year in Saudi Arabia are caused by epilepsy-related reasons, and around about 1,000 in Switzerland, which is a huge number. Now, what are the reasons that these patients of a, that suffer from a normally easily tra um, tractable neurological disease can die? These are some of the reasons, just some. The last one, for example, is one that we cannot really explain at the moment. It's, that's the abbreviation for the sudden unexplained death in epilepsy patients. Everything you see now could possibly be prevented if it was possible to find, to detect the seizure origin, the start of the seizure right in the beginning. We cannot do that in most patients at the moment, otherwise there wouldn't be so many people dying from epilepsy-related causes at the moment. So what can we do? And these are questions I have to ask at the moment. And uh, I think these are challenges for the futures and they could be answered in, in the near future maybe. Of course, we also need more research in epilepsy surgery and pre-surgical evaluations. We need new and better techniques in electrophysiology and imaging studies and neuropsychological studies because if we are successful in around about 70% of all patients that are operated on, we are unsuccessful in about 30%. That needs to be improved. And then there are those patients in whom always medical drugs and surgical treatment will be impossible, and that's meaning that um, we will not be able to make them completely seizure-free. But we should be able to reduce their seizure frequency, to reduce the strength and the power of their seizures, and maybe to, to help them protect themselves. For example, if you know that your seizures will always make you fall, then it would help if you know when the seizures are coming and then you could sit down in time. So we need systems that could detect the onset of a seizure or maybe even predict when a seizure is coming to help the patient protect himself. This is very difficult and it seems that at the moment the, the first uh, devices that have been implanted and just right now a new device has been approved by the FDA in the USA, they have a sensitivity and specificity as far as seizures are concerned of around about 60 to 70 percent as far as I know, which is not bad but not really good. So it seems that personalized care, knowing the EEG of the individual patient using it by new technology to send him a warning when the seizure are impending might be the solution for the future. At the moment, this sounds like science fiction, at least for us practically working epileptologists. But perhaps there are new solutions in the future, but I'll leave this question open to answer for the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Grunwald.